everyone, and welcome to Money Matters with Shannon Jackson, the personal finance show focused on moving you forward financially. It is the month of June, and that means it's Seniors Month here in Canada. And today we're focusing on caring for our aging loved ones. As our loved ones age, there comes a time when important conversations must be had, and those surrounding money can be one of the most difficult. And one question that's often asked is, when do you know it's time to have that money talk? And how do you actually start that conversation? With advice on when and how to start those talks, I'm joined by one of the country's leading authorities on aging issues. She is the president and CEO of CanAge, Canada's national seniors advocacy organization. She teaches law and aging at the University of Toronto and has worked as a lawyer defending the rights of older people. She's also a sought after media expert and speaker on aging issues and the author of the most recently released book, Let's Talk About Aging Parents, A Real Life Guide to Solving Problems. Laura Tamblin Watts, welcome to Money Matters. Delighted to be here. Before we get into our discussion, can you share a little bit about your background and what is CanAge? <laughs> well, let's start there first. So we have um, a lot of issues in Canada with our aging population. I don't think that's a surprise really to anyone. But just to kind of give you a sense of the numbers that we're talking about, do you remember when the Queen used to write a personal letter if you turned 100? And can you imagine Charles with his pen in hand writing so many people because the over 100 group are in fact the fastest growing population that we have in this country and as well in the, the G20. So it's really a surprise to nobody that our population is aging, we're living longer, that's great, but we're not always living better. And that's one of those things that's a myth. In fact, in Canada, we have an eight year gap between living and living well, living in a healthy way. Eight years is the biggest gap in the G20. So we actually need to do a lot more. And what we know is when you're not living well, it also means that costs more too. So CanAge is Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. We look at some of those issues from that policy lens, right? We do a lot of the government advocacy. We work with um, other organizations to improve our whole lives as we age, but represent seniors. And then, you know, there's all this other stuff that you can do yourself. And that's never really been in one easy to read book. And that kind of led me to put this 25 years of academic, legal, financial, and sort of tricks of the trade into a handbook so that people could have a chance to do the best they can for themselves so they don't end up having to live in a way that they don't want to live. Um, and it's hopefully that this is going to be useful. So that's kind of the can age background there. Well, I'm, I'm excited to get into this topic because... As you just mentioned, Canada's population is is aging and going to continue to age over the next few years. The latest numbers from Statistics Canada from 2016 to 2021 show that the number of Canadian, Canadians aged 65 and older rose 18.3% up to 7 million people in the country, which is the second largest increase in 75 years. And the senior population is expected to grow by 68% over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that just further um, establishes what you just mentioned about how things are going to continue in this trend. And as our loved ones age, there comes a time when some of those tough conversations have to take place. Mm -hmm. And Laura, you really cover a lot in your book, and it's being described as the essential book for anyone with an aging parent. And one descriptor that I read says that you cover 27 of life's trickiest kitchen table conversations with the older adults in your life and still like each other enough to sit down for dinner afterwards. So I think that's really appropriate. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to this book and some of the topics that you cover? The book is in four big chunks, and these are so that you can reach to your bedside table at three in the morning when you're up worrying or you've got the call that your mom has fallen or, you know, you've woken up in a panic thinking, oh, I have to do that thing, right? That 3 a.m. horrible feeling that so many of us are very familiar with. So the idea is you could grab the book and just open to the section that you want. The first big chunk is all about 
aging in place, living at home. What can you do to stay there? How do you assess the risks? If you do need to move, how do you downsize? How do you look for a retirement home if you want to have one or not? What are alternatives to retirement homes? And then, of course, the big question, you know, long-term care and, uh, and all the things you need to know about that. The second big chunk is really looking at those powers of attorney, mental capacity, dementia, cognitive impairment questions that many of us spend a lot of time thinking about or worrying about. The third chunk is all about relationships. It's, you know, what do you do with all the guilt that you're feeling? What do you do with their guilt? What do you do with loss? What about the yoga instructor that your 85 year old dad has taken up with? What about the gray divorce, which is hugely on the rise? How do you deal with that? What if your parents are toxic? What if they're a good grandparent, but a lousy parent? Like, how do you build boundaries, right? So it's all of that stuff there, mental health, you know, what about, you know, dad who really likes his cocktails at three o'clock and you know that he's going to not be giving those up anytime soon, right? And then the last chunk is all the stuff that you need to know about health issues. Okay, what the heck is macular degeneration? You open up the page, you read it quickly. What do you need to know about it? Hearing, vision, uh, good old incontinence and how to have a little bit of fun around that. Uh, you know, sex, what do you do around sex? And also the very last chapter is everyone's favorite one, driving. It's at the very end of the book because at 3 a.m. you have to be able to find it fast, right? And so really it arcs through all of those things. And these are conversations that you don't need to have in any particular order, but you're probably going to have at some point. And it's going to come at it from the Canadian perspective, which I think is really important because I think um, we need those resources here local resources and in and, and Canada in particular, because if we're relying on the resources that we're getting from other countries, particularly from the United States, because that's going to be the closest resource. But I think it's really important to have that Canadian perspective of how to deal with these issues. And so can you talk a little bit, because I think what you're, what you're trying to stress in your book is that you want to be proactive in these yeah. conversations as opposed to reactive. Can you talk a little bit about the value of that? So in the magical world that none of us live in, right, we've all had these conversations and no one has any emotional upset about it. Everything is all tickety-boo. And I don't think I've ever met more than one or two families where that's the case. The first thing we have to do is just understand that when I'm talking about family, I really mean whatever your relationships are. That's short form slang. Could be a great aunt, could be a family of choice. It could be a neighbor that you're close to, whatever it is that you like. But in that, you have to understand that it's not the leave it to beaver sitcom family, right? There's mental health. There's the cousin in the closet. There's the, the fact that we don't talk about the fact that dad's actually been cheating on mom for 50 years, right? It's all of these things together. And these are the realities. The unsuccessful son in the basement that's there. Susan from Calgary flies in, fixes things up for 24 hours and flies out while casting aspersions on him. But he's actually the one watching Jeopardy with mom and taking her to appointments, right? It's not this fictionalized idea. It's really the relationships we have. So one part of the book helps you kind of really look at what are the assets you have around you. Okay, you may not love the unsuccessful son in the basement, but he's there. And maybe mom can stay in the house because he's there, but maybe you don't actually want him helping with finances because he might just be helping himself a little bit too much in that regard. So it helps you strategize. The next thing, it really, you have to think about your approach. So here are the two approaches that don't work. I'm going to tell you what to do, mom. You're just going to do it. Ah, ah. That actually never works. And the other one is, I wash my hands of all of you, you know, a pox on all of your houses. That kind of mostly doesn't work either because in the end, chances are it's probably still going to be there whether you've walked away or not, right? You have to figure out the ways in between. So part of what I do is literally give you scripts. If your dad is like this, try these scripts. If your mom is like this, try these scripts. As an example, one of the things we need to confront is this a dreadful narrative that somehow you become the parent to your adult parent. No, bro, you're not, right? You're always still the child. And they think you're a moron. They may love you, but they still think you're 16, right? And they still remember that you lost your wallet at the top of the mountain. And like, these are real issues because you probably haven't lived at home in a long time. So instead of telling them what to do, ask their opinion. Hey, dad. You know, my knee's kind of arthritic from that ski accident I had. And I live in this up-down house and I'm kind of starting to think I'm 52. Like maybe, maybe I should be making a plan. I'd love your thoughts on that. Or, hey, mom, you know, I uh, 
had a bit of a scare, you know, with COVID and it got me thinking, you know, the kids are heading off to university. Do I really want them to be my decision makers? I don't know. And then I thought, well, I'd love your advice on how to do that. Have you kind of done this stuff already? Ask their advice. And then all of a sudden you're much more likely to get it all. Out. Oh, I did it years ago. Oh, I'd love to see what it looks like. Oh, so now all of a sudden you see whether they've got them or they don't have them. They thought they had powers of attorney, but they actually only have wills. Okay. And the wills has your ex-husband still on it, right? So these are some ways in. Another set of ways in is if you are really just trying to figure out what's up with their friends. They're not likely to talk to you about the own self stuff, right? Your own money, because we don't talk about money or health. We don't talk about health, but we talk about other people's money and other people's health. And find out what's happening to Mrs. Lee or Mr. Smith, right? They'll tell you about that retirement home that they went to that they hate. Or they'll tell you about the fact that, you know, they, their biggest fear is to go into long-term care. And that's a way in by kind of coming around the issue. Get the documents to the degree you can, but maybe be prepared to show and tell your own documents. And so all of this, the, these money discussions are really centered around uh, preparing for those that estate planning and all of all of that sort of stuff that we don't really want to do. But it's so critical as we age. And like you said, it's important to review those things every few years to see if any changes need to happen. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of having that estate in place the importance of having a will, uh, executors, power of attorneys. Can you get a little bit into all of that? Absolutely. So what I would say is find the boogeyman and work from there, right? If the government is the boogeyman, tell them, hey, you know what? If you don't actually have a financial power of attorney, um, there's no default, right? The, the public guardian trustee steps in. Most people would have no idea. Hey, if you don't have a will, it means that the stuff is still gonna be distributed, but it may not be to the people who you want. So whatever the boogeyman is in your life, go with that. For some people, it's, I don't, you pay extra taxes, right? Okay, so find that lever to overcome their resistance. Regularize it. So one of the things I often say is April is a good time. You're already doing your taxes, death and taxes. Those are the things that go together. And as people are starting to have to do filings for things, Get this as part of the regular plan. If they work with a financial advisor or an accountant or a bookkeeper, maybe talk to them in advance. Hey, you know, dad's going to come in for his taxes. Can you please prompt a little bit around this as well? So having some extra people as opposed to just you can be helpful. They will gratefully say it. Remember that when you're thinking about powers of attorney and, and substitute decision making, there's different words and different titles for it in different parts of the country. So if you're a Newfoundland Labrador, it would be an advanced care directive. If you're in BC, a representation agreement. Ontario, it's a power of attorney for personal care. Make sure you have your right language there. But fundamentally, you need to create two documents while you're alive and when you're mentally capable to pick somebody. And then you need a third document for when you're dead. And the powers of attorney die with you. So the minute that you're dead, it moves to a will. You can have the same person be your substitute decision maker or your executor, but you really need to make sure that they know what the role is. And don't forget this. You can actually have a financial institution do your financial and property stuff, which I'm a huge fan of, but you can't for your body. You need to find somebody else to be your decision maker if you can't make decisions. All of this has been really great information. And as we head to, into our break, in the next segment, we're going to be talking about age-proofing our homes, when to have those discussions about whether it's appropriate for someone to continue to live in the home, whether they should maybe be looking at long-term care. Some really great stuff coming up, and I really appreciate everything that you've given us so far. So stick around until Money Matters returns. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. The ice tilts in favor of men. But that will never stop us. United by passion, battling for equity. We are the National Women's Para Hockey Team of Canada. We're here. We're hungry. We're ready. Ready to inspire. Ready to leave our legacy. Ready to be supported and make history. It's our time. Are you ready? 
You're watching an interesting local show on Rogers TV and you want to know more. That's when you head to rogerstv.com. Our website provides more information about our programs, our hosts, our schedule, and about how you too can get involved with Rogers TV. Visit us online at rogerstv.com. Welcome back to Money Matters with Shannon Jackson. My guest today is Laura Tamblin Watts, President and CEO of CanAge, lawyer and speaker on, on aging issues. She's also the author of the book, Let's Talk About Aging Parents, A Real Life Guide to Solving Problems. And June is Seniors Month. So we're talking about your book definitely in the, at the right time. And before the break, we talked about the importance of having that money talk with our aging loved ones and also to ensure that that estate planning is in place. And so having a discussion about finances is always important because it allows you to better prepare for expenses that maybe lie ahead. Uh, because the reality is, as we age, these tough, de tough decisions, I should say, are going to be made, especially when it comes to living arrangements for our family. And so according to one recent survey, over three quarters of, of Canadians, about 78%, want to age in their current homes. And remaining independent and avoiding the long-term care are really drivers for a lot of Canadians, including over 60% of seniors who said that they are planning to modify their homes for care reasons. So there's a lot to think about, about aging seniors and having them to be able to stay in their homes. Can you share some advice, both for those seniors who might be watching, but also their caregivers, on what should be considered when they're, when they're thinking about wanting to stay in their homes? Yeah, this book is going to help you. Let's talk about aging parents. Whole first chunk is about, you probably don't need to move as much as you think you need to, but you probably do need to modify. So good news from a financial point of view, at CanAge with other organizations, we fought really hard. You have a $20,000 refundable tax credit to modify your home. Many people don't realize that. $20,000 off the top. You don't have to use it all in one go either. And if you've got more people living in your home, more generations, another $10,000 per person. So there's a bit of money to help you um, and a bit of support around that. There's some really easy things you can do right? And I go through it with a dollar sign, kind of like as if you're going to a restaurant, like $1, $2 signs, $3 signs, and so on, and kind of give you the skinny on what's really helpful. What's most helpful? Don't fall. Don't fall. So get two banisters, two, right? Not one. We always have one. You need two banisters. That costs you about a hundred bucks down at the hardware store with some good brackets. Reduces falls by 56%. So it's not always that stairs are the enemy, falling is the enemy. Get really some grit on the stairs, maybe take some of that carpet off and put some really gritty stuff on it. You can buy that for like 10 bucks at the store as well, or even put some sand on it. These are things that make a difference. If you fall and break a hip, the chances of dying in the first one year are 24%, 40% in two years. And if you don't die as a woman, your chances of ever walking normally again are less than 20%. So don't fall. I really mean it. 100 bucks, go get second banisters with good, good clips on them, not those cheap ones. You can put those also horizontally on hallways. If you're seeing that mom's a bit tippy, you put them horizontally. If you've ever had kids and toddlers, they need to be able to cruise. Put those so that they can keep a hand. I think two is better, of course. Those are great things. You know what? The main floor bedroom is one of those things that often is a real stumbling block for people. That dining room that no one's eaten at since 2008, take that set out there with the china cabinet. No one's using it anyway, right? Put barn sliding doors on that and all of a sudden you've got a main floor dining room. And often you can change that powder room pretty easily. And if you are changing the powder room, make it a wet room. So with a hand shower and everything so that you can turn a powder room into a wet room and shower there. And the main floor laundry. Like these are the things you want. In the kitchen, automatic shut off everything. And that's normal these days. If you're worried about mom and dad not eating, change the fridge to a glass front fridge because if they see the food, they're more likely to eat the food. All of these tricks in the trades are there. Help you stay at home. You can also do something called a home share program. Get a bit of revenue, get a younger person in there. They help to pay a bit. They have extra eyes on it as well. So lots of good strategies to stay in the same place. 
And what about, are there any um, uh, programs in place to help with sort of the medical side uh, of things if you're able to stay at home? Yeah, this is where, Shannon, we kind of have to take a deep breath and realize what we want and what is real is not the same thing. Okay. So, yes, home care, of course, is the most important thing. And you go through your health authority, or if you're in Ontario, it's health teams, we used to call them LINs, whatever they call it in your area. You go through that process, you get assessed, they check what they call activities of daily living, what help do you need, and then they give you a certain number of hours a week. It's almost always not enough. And the reality is, if you're in Ontario, there's a 6,000 person waiting list formally for home care. 6,000 persons who have been approved for home care where there is no home care. It's more like 10,000, but it's formally 6,000. So this is where you need to take a deep breath and realize that you're going to have to spend some money. It is probably the best money that you can spend, however, and some of it you can write off your taxes. So you want to talk to your financial planner around making sure that you're optimizing any tax credits around uh, getting agency help in. It is hugely important to stay in the same area because when you move across the country or whatever, it almost always has a bad effect on you. You become more disoriented, you become disconnected. So if you are going to invest some money, home care is really where to invest it. How expensive is it? Well, okay, this is where we worry about living our money because we didn't plan to live this long and interest rates were low, right? And debt was high. And so people may need to just have a hard look at their money. If you want 24 hour home care, you know, the lowest I've ever seen is $100,000 a year. I usually think about $300,000 is what we're looking at in the sort of on Southern Ontario area. Most people can't afford that. So what community-based services do you have? You'd be amazed at what community-based services. And the book helps you go through breaking down what some of those things are. Lawn care, okay, snow shoveling. That's not home care anyway, but there's services that you can either hire or there's sometimes free programs that you can sign up to. Check your municipality. Often some of those programs are there. The other trick that I have is check what accessibility and disability services are available. Because many older people actually have physical needs that are qualifying for disability credits or disability accommodations. But they may not think about that. They just think, oh, I'm getting older. I've got arthritis. Well, Actually, get the note from your doctor, and all of a sudden, you can sign up to all kinds of different disability-based and accessible services. So this book helps you figure out how to get the help that you need to stay in the same place. I love that you have all of this very specific advice, and I know that your book is going to have so much more, and it's going to be a benefit for a lot of people. As you're talking about them, it, it seems like they're almost like hacks. They're, you know, some some things can be very simple things to do in, in your home, but there's also advice on where to find those other resources that maybe you're not aware of, like those tax credits, which is really, really um, helpful for everyone to know. And this sort of leads us into the conversation about when is it then appropriate to have that really difficult conversation about possibly going into a senior's home? Yeah. How, how would you, or what's your advice on how to approach that? Come in through the side door. It depends on whether or not you've got a triggering event. So a triggering event is mom has fallen and broken hip. Dad's got a diagnosis of dementia and can't be home anymore, right? If there's a triggering event, you're probably going to have to look at it. And the decisions are usually, are you going into some type of seniors home, assisted living, you know, in Ontario, we call them retirement homes, different names for different things. In Ontario, and it's the only province in the whole country, you're on your own financially. Every other jurisdiction, there's some financial help from the government if you can't afford it, and you need something that's less than long-term care and more than home care, right? But in Ontario, we're on our own, and it can be very expensive. It could be, you know, maybe $4,000 a month. It could be $15,000 a month, and you're buying your services. Remember, you can still get publicly funded home care services into retirement homes. So that triggering event is probably real. Most people do not move into a retirement home until they probably almost need to move out of a retirement home. So those kind of 
Places that have villages are very useful. So independent living on one hand, they can downsize into some apartments, but they know that just around the corner, that same company may have some additional support. So that kind of village approach can be very useful. It doesn't give you a front of the line to the long-term care home. And that's that next piece. So often the amount of time that people will live in a retirement home is only like 18 months to two years. In Ontario, the average age is 86 in a retirement home, 83 in long-term care. So remember, retirement homes often are very frail as well. If you are getting into long-term care, you don't just check yourself in. You have to get an assessment. That's going to happen through the health authority from the health teams. And then you're going to be on a list. There's a 43,000 person waiting list in Ontario formally. Informally, it's probably closer to 60,000. So the reality of the circumstances, we have to age in place as much as we can because precious long-term care, you're not getting until you really pass need it. So as you're as you're sort of talking about these issues, um, I mean, we've already sort of touched on how our aging population is going to keep growing. And all of the, t- the statistics that are out there are sh- showing that trend. And of course, if we fast forward a little bit only to 2030, which is only six years from now, boomers are going to start turning 85. Yep. Gen Xers are going like, to be 65. 65, like us, yep. <laughs> right. And then the millennials, which is my group, we're all going to be turning 50. Yeah. So we're we're starting to head into that into that um, school of thought where we're we have to prepare for retirement. We have to think about these things to make sure our loved ones are cared for. And it sounds to me by just based on our conversation so far is there's some things I think that perhaps Canada or even maybe Ontario should maybe focus on and maybe some changes that might need to be happening. Um, surrounding our aging population. Can you talk about some things that maybe supports that you think are, you believe are needed? Oh, there's so much that we have to do. We don't even have a national strategy on aging. That should tell you how behind it we are. I mean, I think from a governmental point of view, the government needs to put an aging lens on every single decision it makes. And we're advocating for that. But we need to do that as well. And that's why this book helps you put an aging lens on everything you look at. I mean, we want to get rid of mandatory withdrawal of RIFs, right? Because it makes no sense that you have to do it at 71. That was created when the average age of death was 74. So one of the things that we need to do is look at the longevity in a realistic way. And that's going to mean that you really need to think about your finances. As I say, debt was cheap and interest rates were low. Now we're seeing those opposite things flip and people who were solidly middle class are now losing their homes because they're trying to retire at a point where they can't afford even a mortgage. Remember the idea of retiring with a mortgage was so baffling and now it's normal. So we really need to be thinking creatively. Again, things like home shares or golden girl style, these kinds of creative ways where we keep social connection are important. The last thing I would say is if you're thinking about what's most important on your checklist making sure that we're avoiding loneliness and keeping socially connected is the most important thing. Loneliness is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, takes up to eight years off your life and makes you more likely to fall. So when you're thinking about your financial plan, think about how are you gonna stay connected with people and how are those relationships going to uh, keep close? Cause that's actually probably the thing you've got the most control over. Laura, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate our conversation. For those who want to reach out to you, maybe follow you on social media, but most importantly, pick up your book. How can they do that? <laughs> well, the book is everywhere that you buy your books and on audiobook. I think a lot of people are on audiobook. And what we see is people are buying them for all their siblings and be like, look, turn to chapter nine. We got to deal with this stuff together. Right? So that makes it easy. I'm at uh, L. Tamblin Watts and you can find us at canage.ca. That's C-A-N-A-G-E dot C-A. And again, we're all over social media. You can buy the book anywhere that you do buy your books. Um, and again, electronic format, audio format, paper format, whatever works for you and your family. I hope the book helps you through this 40 years that we're going to be working on these issues together. Thank you so much, Laura, for being here and sharing your advice. And I want to thank you, our viewers, for watching. Until next time, I'm Shannon Jackson. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. Today, I help the senior find transportation.